Hi everyone, my name is Leila Saberi and I'm a member of AGU H3S or Hydrology Student Hydrology Section Student Subcommittee. Thanks for joining us today for our third quasi H3S cyber seminar series, Beyond Grad School, a guide to landing your dream job. If you were around during the last two weeks, we talked about the pre-application phase, sort of um, when to start looking for positions and where to look, and application phase, focusing on application materials uh, and preparation for interview process. If you were not able to attend the last sessions, you can find the link to recorded videos on Quasi's website. This week, we are going to talk about post-application negotiations, including preparing startup packages, negotiating for salaries, vacations, and this sort of things. Similar to our last panels, we'll have our panelists introduce themselves. You can see them on the screen. And then we'll have a few questions to get things started. But we are really looking forward to uh, attendees to ask their questions at any time. Um, there is a chat box or question box on the toolbar. So at any point in time, feel free to send your questions and we'll get to those um, uh, in the second half of the seminar. So with that, uh, we should get started and I'm going to ask the panelists to introduce themselves and sort of the, their current position and then um, answer to two initial questions that we have for them. First, where the, the parts of um, post-application negotiations that caught you off guard or you hadn't prepared for? And then the second question being is, uh, is there anything that you wish you'd known going through the post-application phase or anything you would have done differently? So with that, uh, with that all, I'll pass it to Dr. Ruth Heindel. Hi everyone, my name is Ruth Heindel um, and I'm currently a postdoc at the University of Colorado Boulder uh, at the Institute of Arctic and Alpine Research. But starting in January, um, I'm going to be an assistant professor in environmental studies at Kenyon College, which is a small liberal arts uh, undergraduate institution in central Ohio. Um, I have an interdisciplinary earth sciences background. Uh, my research focuses on soils and atmospheric dust in cold regions. So I'm more kind of hydrology adjacent rather than an actual hydrologist. Um, I've done a lot of field work in Greenland, Antarctica, and the mountains of Colorado. Um, and I'll be bringing all of that research and my field focus to Kenyan. Um, I think that the thing that caught me off guard about the post-application negotiations um, was how quickly they wanted my startup package. Um, I know we're gonna get into startup packages more later, um, but institutions often want to negotiate very quickly, and that doesn't give you a lot of time to kind of come up with your startup package, especially because it takes time to get quotes um, and to really think about your budget. So I guess what I would like to have known, I would like to have known this beforehand so that I could have spent more time earlier um, kind of thinking about that and planning for it. Um, it's really hard to do this while you're simultaneously prepping for your interview, uh, but I definitely think it's worth it to, t to really think through your startup package as early as possible. Thanks. Oh, um, anyone want to? <laughs> Yeah, thank you, uh, Dr. Ruth Handel. So with that, we can move on to Dr. Denika Rowe. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, cool. Um, hi, I'm Danica Roth. I just started um, an assistant professorship at the Colorado School of Mines 
I'm a geomorphologist and surface process person. I my background was physics and astrophysics before grad school, so I focused more on kind of sediment transport mechanics and landscape processes, um, mainly sediment transport in rivers and after wildfires on hills. Uh, so for post application negotiations, I completely agree about the timing. Uh, I had two job offers and they both wanted to start up budget certain lists within like days. Um, I was able to push back for a week for one and the other was willing to wait for the other the other uh, institute to, to figure some things out. But it, it's super, super fast. So I would definitely agree that try, like starting to work on your startup package right now, <laughs> anything that occurs to you, start putting it on a list, start asking for advice and examples from friends and mentors now. Um, because man, it happens fast. Um, I was also surprised with just how supportive and helpful everybody was once I started reaching out. Um, I hadn't prepared for, for that kind of timeline. And so I was just desperately emailing everyone I knew. And so many people were just so warm and willing to share examples, budgets, quotes, um, their own startup lists, all kinds of things. Um, so reach out for that support because it's out there. Um, and then the last thing was, I think, just how different different department heads were to negotiate with. It was a pretty stark difference between uh, the two institutes I was I was talking with, and it was it was kind of good to see just the range of how how different departments might work and how negotiations might work. So if you don't end up with multiple offers, um, still just talk to other people to get a sense of 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 what the range might be. <clears throat> and make sure you're negotiating appropriately with the kind of institute that you're working with. Um, for the things I wish that I had known going into the application phase or doing things differently, I honestly, I wish that I had gotten more things in writing. I, I did a good job of getting many things in writing and that has really saved me uh, a few times so far. But there are a few things that I wish I had gotten in writing that I didn't. Um, and there were also a lot of expenses that I didn't even think about, um, things like rewiring the electricity in my lab. Um, it's like a few thousand dollars I did not account for, uh, things like that. So another reason to start thinking about that budget start up a lot earlier. I think that's about it. Thank you. Um, Dr. James Heiss? Uh, hello, everybody. I'm James Heiss. Uh, I am an uh, assistant professor at UMass Lowell. Uh, I've been here for just over a year now. Um, my research interests are in coastal hydrogeology. Uh, so I kind of think about how waves, tides, sea level rise affect uh, the distribution of groundwater in coastal aquifers. Uh, so I kind of do you know, a bunch of field work uh, and then kind of combine those field measurements into numerical models. Uh, so yeah, as far as thinking about uh, stuff that I really wish I would have known, um, I wholeheartedly agree with uh, Ruth and Danica so far. Um, this startup package, so when I first got uh, an offer, it came from the dean and it came in, in the form of a phone call. And he asked me what my startup package was, and I didn't have one. So I would absolutely recommend getting started early on. Uh, and I know it can be very difficult because you are preparing for interviews. Uh, you might be reading papers of different faculty that you're going to be meeting with. But it's totally worth it to spend the time to put one together. Um, and again, I know that involves getting quotes. It can take a long time. Uh, but uh, I, I absolutely recommend doing that as far ahead of time as possible. Thank you, uh, James. Dr. Walter McDonald. All right, hey everybody. I'm Walter McDonald. I'm uh, um, just finished up my third year as an assistant professor at Marquette University in the civil engineering department. And my area of research is in urban stormwater management and environmental monitoring. Um, and so in thinking of uh, things that caught me off guard, I don't know, you know, I, if there was necessarily anything that caught me off guard in the negotiation process, but there's certainly things that I would do differently. And so 
One of those is I would really echo what Danica said in terms of getting everything into writing. So when I first got my um, startup letter, you know, there's a lot of different bullets in there. And there's some things that are pretty clear, like dollars, you know, you know there's uh, no, there's clarity in that um, and things with numbers behind them. But there were other things that, uh, you know, you could maybe interpret one way or another or weren't quite clear. And so in asking for clarification, I got it orally, but I didn't get it in writing, right? So they didn't actually change the letter. I just said, oh, okay, that's what that bullet means. That'll be great. Um, you know, but things change. You know, your department head might leave and then people say, well, that's not how things operate. So if there's any ambiguity in your letter or in some of the things that people say, uh, ask to get it in writing. It's not that big of a deal. Um, and that's when I think you'll really, you know, the, like some of these things are not, um, you know, it wouldn't change whether I accepted the offer or not, but certainly uh, would help out just having clarification on the resources and things that you'll be able to uh, work with once you get there. So that's what I would recommend uh, is just to, um, you know, cross your T's and dot your I's when it comes to that uh, that signed document. Uh, great. Thank you. That was really helpful. And we already have some good questions coming in. So to um, Danica specifically, uh, we have a question that uh, you said that you wish you had more things done in writing. And the question is, what kind of things did you not get into a writing that you wish you would? Oh boy, um, let's see. Well, maybe first I'll, I'll start with the things that I, I didn't expect to matter that I did get in writing was um, my office lab uh, storage and space for my students. Um, and I happened to have just a casual email from the department head um, saying, yes, you will have students, room for students in this particular lab and this, this lab is yours. Um, and then later on when it came time to assign students to offices, I was told, oh, like students get assigned first come first serve, uh, yours are gonna end up in the attic. Um, unfortunately, I had that email that um, meant my students are in the office that's attached to my office, which is great. Um, other things were I, <laughs> one of the major pieces of equipment that I bought was a two and a half ton gamma spectroscopy unit. Um, and it did not occur to me that we might need to get the floor reinforced to support that weight in my lab. Um, or the electrical wiring, it needed uh, an isolated circuit. There, we needed to hire people to help deliver it up to the lab, um, installation and stuff like that. Um, those things all added up, so it ended up being something like $8,000 um, that I didn't really count for. Um, I just found out that while my department casually told me that uh, they have financial support for professors and students to attend conferences where they're presenting, which is pretty common in many departments. Um, the amount I didn't realize was kind of fluctuates. So they told me a certain amount. And since I started, they've cut that amount uh, pretty drastically. And that was another place where fortunately my department head was willing to honor, um, honor the old price, but again, it was because I had an email. Um, there are a couple other things um, that I've mainly heard other colleagues talk about. Um, I, I know a few people who were promised lab space that has not materialized, or they're now being told like, oh, well, actually, you're going to end up in this other lab that's definitely not as good. Um, and they didn't manage to get those things in writing. So they're, they're now stuck in a suboptimal lab. Um, Let's see, anything else? Uh, I would just say anything that occurs to you to discuss, if it's worth having a conversation about or mentioning, it's worth putting in writing. Um, just don't assume that anything, space, materials, money, support, um, class reviews, anything like that, don't assume that that will be the case um, once, once you get there. So make sure you have it written. Uh, so I, I have a thought um, that came to mind um, about what Danica said about making sure that, you know, for as, as an example, that your 
floor can support a certain weight, and you have if you might have to add that to your startup package. Um, some universities might just kind of already clump renovations for a lab into their own college costs, which means that you might not even have to pay for those kinds of renovations. So if you get a, you know, if you put your um, your startup package together, you have all your equipment included, and it comes to some amount of money, let's say it's $200,000 or whatever, then you might not have to add onto that 200,000 renovation costs. I mean, renovating a lab can be very, very expensive, but if the university is already kind of assuming that they're gonna be paying for that, then you might not even have to put that into your startup package. So I would you know, explicitly ask if the university is covering those renovation costs, or if you should be including those costs into your startup package. I would imagine, I mean, cause it'd be difficult for faculty, at least for me to know how much it's gonna to cost to renovate a lab. I mean, I don't know anything about that kind of stuff. So um, I would just be sure to check again, whether or not your startup package includes, or you should be including funds that would go towards renovating your lab space. And I would add to that, that um, a few people have warned me when I was dealing with uh, the other the other institute that I had an offer from where I would have had lab renovations. A few people warned me to always make sure to negotiate for your renovations being separate from your startup if possible, because if you budget a certain amount for a renovation, apparently they often go like $100,000 over easily, something like that. Um, so if you can negotiate it to just be covered separate from, from any budget that you're accounting for, that's always a good idea. Yeah, exactly. I, I just want to echo the um, kind of thinking about space requirements. <laughs> um, I know we're talking about this a lot, but I'm currently in a situation where um, I'm not totally sure where my lab space is going to be because they're kind of changing where they think my program is going to be. Um, and I had, you know, I had said that I need a lab with certain requirements and I had put that in my startup package in writing, um, but they still kind of seemed surprised when I reiterated oh. these needs. Um, and so, you know, in addition to thinking about equipment, just also be thinking about space and you're you may be talking my, all of my negotiations were with a provost um, who knows nothing about labs so you may be talking to someone who doesn't understand about a hood or di water you know things that are very basic um, so just be prepared for that well, one other thing to add on is that don't assume that the person you're negotiating with is going to be the person in charge once you start I one thing that I forgot to get in writing was um, the dean told me that she would be willing to cover um, like a ten thousand dollar training expense uh, because other other professors here would be able to attend it um, for my for my gamma spec and uh, we've had a lot of administrative turnover. We have a new dean. We have a new department head. Um, and like I said, fortunately, people have been willing to honor things, but there, it was about, I don't know, three, four months of back and forth to, to actually get uh, some of those promises honored. And, and it might not have worked out that way if I wasn't lucky, so. Well, thank you, that was so helpful. And we have one more question. <clears throat> so. What is all items that should be included in the startup package? And I know some of you mentioned that it differs from department to department. So it would be great if we can hear that from all of you. Um, anybody who has answer and wants to go first? I can start maybe. Um, so this does definitely de depend on your, not only your department, but also the type of institution. So I am at a purely undergraduate institution. So I am not including things like, um, you know, anything to do with graduate students, or uh, it's also not common to have someone who's a lab manager, um, but those could be included in sort of packages elsewhere. Um, 
There's also a lot of other kind of external funding for undergraduate student support. So that's not something that I had to include in my startup package, but that might be something you would include elsewhere. Um, so my startup package um, included lab instrumentation, um, also field equipment, um, and that I kind of broke into different categories of actual like large pieces of field equipment and then just a category of um, kind of general lab supplies and general field supplies um, that I didn't have to go into every single um, you know, shovel and, you know, different things that I would be buying, but you can kind of group some things together, um, the ones that aren't as expensive and say, okay, I'll just be buying some, you know, general lab supplies. Another category was um, lab consumables. Um, so things that you'll be going through on a regular basis. Um, and also uh, think about kind of software um, and computer needs. So this is another thing that probably depends on institution. My office computer is not included in my startup package. So that comes from the institution. But if I wanted to have any kind of lab specific computer, that would need to be in the startup package. Um, another thing that I didn't include, but I know that some people included um, are is some funds to buy um, textbooks if you want to like try some out and see um, what different textbooks are like. Um, maybe I'll stop there and let other people fill in. Uh, I can I can uh, chime in. So yeah, I, I included. You know, I included a lot of detail because I felt that when you're if, if you're doing field work, then a lot of little things can add up. So I, I think the smallest item that I included was a twenty five dollar item. Uh, and again, I did that because I I felt that just just things would add up. Um, so, yeah, I included things down to twenty five dollars and of course, obviously bigger things, too. Um, one thing that you might want to think about is the lab square footage, um, because I think lab space might mean very different things from one person to another and from one kind of um, renovation company to another. So, you know, if you've worked in a lab before, then, you know, try to get the square footage of that lab that you worked in uh, so that you can then explicitly tell them what square footage uh, you would like or, you know, within a, a range. Um, other things I uh, included in there is um, summer salaries. So if you're on a nine or 10 month uh, contract, then sometimes you can include in there uh, summer salaries. So I believe typically you get uh, one month summer salary for three years. A typical startup package is about three years. So if you can get a, a summer salary, one month summer, summer salary for the duration of your startup package. I think you're, you're in good shape. Um, as I said, so, so three years is, is pretty typical, um, but you know, like anything, anything is, uh, is uh, negotiable. So, you know, you can, you know, try and, and, you know, you can, you kind of have more leeway if you have other offers, but if you, you know, if you do have other offers and you can ask for, you know, a longer startup package, see what see what happens but I think you know asking for things is certainly expected of you um, once you have an offer this is really the only time that you have um, more pull so keep that in mind and and um, yeah just keep that in mind that they want you and at this point you're the one that's making the decision This is... <laughs> go, go ahead, Danica. Okay. Um, yeah, so I, I agree with everything that's been said. And again, the I would say making sure that you understand what is standard for your institute specifically um, is really important. And also understanding where the money for your startup is going to come from, who has the power to grant what, because that might also vary by institute. 
And oftentimes the department is not the one that's paying for most of your startup. It's coming from like academic affairs or one of the other academic offices. Um, so really it's in the department's best interest to negotiate with the university on your behalf. So remembering to like understand how that falls out and then asking within those constraints for everything that you can possibly justify because the the more things you ask for the more things you're likely to get and you don't want to end up with you know with regrets over it um so also justifying anything that uh that you're asking for whether it could be shared with others used for collaboration used for teaching um if you give them a justified list then you're a lot more likely to to get requests granted um so specifics i would say uh uh, like previously said, uh, more salary. I would also recommend looking up public information if it's available or asking your chair for what the last few starting salaries have been so you'll know what's standard. Um, and I can't stress enough, remember to include fringe benefits. That was something I did not include and it's like 32%. Adding on 32% to every RA ship, every postdoc salary, my own summer salary, I did not realize that that was a thing and it, it makes your salary money go a lot farther if you if you include that. Um, in addition, uh, yeah, major equipment as already mentioned, computers, things like that. Um, you can also negotiate for TA ships um, if they're competitive. At Mines, we have a limited number to hand out. So um, get, getting a guarantee that you'll have a couple of TA ships for students the first few years. Um, or RA ships. Postdocs, I think, are a really good idea. I didn't manage to get one, but I think I've heard a, a lot of people mention that like just results happen a lot faster if you have a postdoc rather than a grad student. Um, and then I think also enough money to cover all the expenses um, in detail. I think down to $25 is a great idea. Um, for all expenses for a couple of pilot projects so that you'll have the resources you need to collect data to provide like proof of concepts to write grants to get more money. Um, being able to hit the ground running like that is great. You can also negotiate for teaching releases uh, so that you don't have to teach your first semester or two. Um, so I just started teaching even though I started in January and having, having my time free until now has been a huge advantage. Um, job help for a spouse, even if your institute doesn't have uh, like a partner hire policy, sometimes they'll be willing to, you know, give your spouse or partner a, a one year postdoc or something like that to, to help them uh, get on their feet or there might be administrative positions, things like that, um, that, that might be available to, to help out while they're looking for something else if they're not interested in an academic job. Um, also, let's see, starting date. You can negotiate for an earlier or later starting date um, if you want to finish up a postdoc. Or I wanted to have a few months to travel. Um, Sorry, I'm just wondering if we want to stick to the startup package, like instrumentation lab stuff, or just go off. Oh, on these are things that I negotiated for in my startup package. This is, it's like I had a monetary and equipment list, a personnel list and a non-monetary list that included things like lab space, my starting date, uh, teaching releases, all of those sorts of things. Um, yeah, I think, yeah, I, I think it's to include in the startup package. Yeah, I think startup package is, yeah, as, as Danica is saying, it's, it's everything and anything that you envision having a cost from the time that you start till ideally, you know, the, the time that you get your, your first grant, because the, the idea is that the startup package is gonna maintain your research program until you get your first grant or smaller grants to, to maintain your research program. Mm -hmm. uh, so, oh, sorry, Dan, you can keep going. Sorry to interrupt. No worries. I, I feel like one of the reasons I think I've, I've, when I'm giving people advice for negotiations, I think these non-monetary things are often overlooked and they can occasionally be easier to negotiate for because there might be a cap on how much actual money they can give you. But if you ask for, say, a teaching release, that's something they might be able to give you with a little more flexibility or switching starting dates or um, another really, really good one, if you can get your institute to agree to it, is 
an extension or no deadline on using your start it. Um, many institutes will have like a two to five year deadline on if you don't use your startup money by that deadline, you have to give it back. And uh, a lot of schools are switching to being pretty, pretty hard lined about that. Um, but if you can get them to give you an extension or, or just get rid of the deadline, that means that if you can manage to get a grant, um, you have this slush fund that I've talked to people who are, you know, 10 years into professorship and they're still like drawing on their, their startup slush fund. Um, uh, office furniture was something I didn't account for. I didn't even think about how much a desk would cost, but, um, or like I have an office couch, uh, things like that can, I, I guess just to maybe echo, echo Walter, the, um, I think of every single expense that you can possibly imagine needing and at least write it down because those things might add up quite a bit. Thank you. Anybody else wants to add anything to this? Uh, okay, so with that, um, we can move to our next question that um, mm, beside startup packages, did you have to negotiate for your salaries or um, vacations, including uh, maternity and pa uh, maternity leave? Uh, and um, how much it changed, these negotiations really changed um, the default offer? Anybody who has an answer could start. I think the panelists are muted. Hello? Yes, James, oh. we can hear you. Okay, sorry about that. I don't know, there was a, I was on mute somehow. Um, I think somehow everybody got muted. So panelists, if you just want to manually unmute yourselves, just a heads up. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, I was just going to add a, a couple more things to things that you can include in a in a in, in a startup uh, package. Uh, one thing is publication costs. Those can be kind of expensive, so you might want to include those. Um, another thing is uh, even uh, health insurance. Uh, so some institutions, your health insurance might not begin exactly on your start date. There might be some time lag. Uh, so maybe look into that and to see whether or not you would have to purchase health insurance elsewhere, but you can include that kind of thing. Um, other things are moving costs. So that can absolutely be included. Um, and was there anything else? No, I don't think so. So I wanted to add. One um, thing, sorry. yeah. One thing to add with the moving cost is that um, you could also ask for a trip out to look for housing. Mm -hmm. um, so that's something that I got money for. Um, and then, um, yeah, I just also like all of these. I think also depend on the type of institution that you're um, negotiating with. So for instance, you know, Danica mentioned the course release, which is really great um, and can be very a very good thing to negotiate for. Um, for my institution, which is a very much a teaching focused institution, um, that's not something that I decided to ask for because I don't think it would have gone very far, um, but I did ask for a delayed start date. Um, so I think you just have to be smart about um, what are your big asks uh, in thinking about what type of institution you're negotiating with? And this is Walter, and I'll just add to this and a little bit to the other one because I was muted, is uh, I'll echo the moving costs. I moved across the country in a U-Haul in the rain with my wife when she was pregnant, and like I did not like factor in how much that stuff was going to cost. 
Um, so I really wish I had uh, asked for more money to move. Um, the other thing that I'll say is when, you know, putting things into your startup package and trying to figure out, you know, how much money will I need for equipment and stuff. I was coming out of my PhD and like I, I definitely had a plan of what I was going to do in the interview, but I didn't really know what I was going to do. So it was difficult to know like what I should ask for. Um, and so I just asked for a lot, you know, anything I could think of. And I've pro I probably in my, I went a different direction when I got there and probably bought like maybe three things that I had originally proposed. Um, so what you put in there that you're going to buy isn't like firm and solid that you have to spend it on that. Uh, it's just kind of to get you in that ballpark number. Um, and then when negotiating things, my uh, I was negotiating with my department head who was pretty frank on like, hey, here's, you know, the 10 items. These are the three that we can probably play ball with. And if you ask for more here, I can go up to the college or university level. And here are the things that I don't really have power to change. Um, so that was helpful. Yeah, I agree. I think it can be difficult to... <clears throat> recall or, or try to remember all of these items. Um, one thing that I kind of did mentally is I walked through kind of in my head what my ideal lab would look like and where things would be and what would be there. And that helped me um, identify items that you know I might not have otherwise remembered. Okay, thank you. Um, so, um, we have one more question. So, um, what is the order of operations for negotiation process after you get the offer? For example, you get a phone call and then a verbal offer of salary and a startup and then you will negotiate through that offer, and what is the what are the next steps? Um, I guess I can start. Um, I got a phone call um, actually first from the chair of my search committee, um, saying that I was given the offer, and then also that you know I would be getting another phone call from the provost. Um, so I got that phone call from the provost and, um, in that phone call with the, whoever is offering you the, the, um, position, I would say, don't like agree to anything in that phone call. You don't have to, you can, you know, something is going to come in writing and you're going to also then respond in writing. So that phone call, you can just say like, great, thank you. I need to think about things. And then that will be the phone call. Um, so then I got an email with, um, salary and the, you know, the formal offer. And I was then asked to kind of give my startup package. Um, so then I think I had maybe, it was really just a few days to then kind of give my counter offer with, um, that's when I asked for the, you know, my salary negotiation, the startup package, and the kind of the start date delit deferment, I asked all of those for all of those at the same time. Um, and then we continued the negotiations. But if someone else has a different <laughs> kind of timeline, you can go ahead. Um. I can I can chime in maybe just because I mine was slightly different only because when I got my my first offer I was I think it was the week that I was interviewing at at Mines which uh, I was pretty sure might be my top choice and so I was able to ask um, the first institute that gave me an offer if they would be willing to extend uh, my my response time until I found out from mines. So or maybe it was I was expecting to hear back from mines that week. It was it was something like that. But they were willing to again I think Cindy mentioned earlier, once you have an offer, 
you're in a really good position for negotiating because they've already decided that they want you. So um, you can um, respectfully and uh, you know trying to work within whatever their concerns are, but you can you can ask for a little bit of understanding on things like you're waiting to hear from another another job or you need to extend your uh, your starting date because you're finishing the postdoc or whatever it is. Um, so I I was kind of going back and forth um, between both institutes and uh, I think once they both knew that I had two offers on the table, they both invited me out for a second visit. Um, so if you end up in that situation, definitely like communicating um, that you are considering a second offer um, because you don't want to, you know, if you're on, if you're on the fence about them, you don't want to be swayed in one direction because the other one doesn't know that they should be negotiating harder because they're up against another institute. Um, so I was brought out for a second visit to both places and um, got a second chance to like meet with a bunch of people and meet some of the administration. Um, and I think there was also there's a lot of phone calling about uh, kind of what ranges of of salaries and, and startups and things like that would be. Um, and then they told me they would, um, like Ruth was saying, they would send me a written offer. Um, and one of the institutes uh, actually told me, so I'm going to send you a letter. Um, it's going to quote this much for salary. And when you get that, you need to email me back and tell me that you want more salary because that's the standard thing that the like admit academic affairs is going to offer, but like we can do better for you. Um, which is great, and I think that's that's a really good sign for your department head to be, you know, helping you negotiate. Um, the let's see, the next steps were once you know you you kind of go back and forth with uh, asking for more stuff, getting it in writing. If you have the chance to visit a second time, kind of like making sure that there's nothing at the institute that you didn't think about uh, needing, you can you can potentially. Uh, ask for additional things that you didn't think of um until until you sign things you know and yeah and then signing paperwork and and it's official i think that's about it i can i can uh, go next i think all of our conversations and negotiations were done on the phone um so and yeah, and if, and if you do end up getting multiple offers, you know, you might get first, uh, you know, I th I, it's probably going to vary. So sometimes you might get a, an email from the chair of the search committee. Other times you might get a co uh, cold call from the chair or from the dean. Um, so again, I think it's, it's a good idea to think about these kinds of things before you get to that potential point where you might be getting uh, some phone calls. Um, so I, I remember I talked to the dean early on when there was uh, an offer and, you know, he kind of just laid out the, the different um, kind of salaries, what kind of startup packages typically are. And then, um, you know, you say you're, you're going to think about it and, you know, you might want to modify your startup package a little bit. Um, and then, you know, I had a uh, another offer that came in, I was lucky kind of around the same time. And I would imagine that that might not happen very often because, you know, search committees can get started at completely different times and offers come at completely different times. Um, but if you do get another offer and then, you know, I, I would recommend that you make it known that you do have another one. You can just say, you know, I've, I've been offered another position, you know, I'm excited about this one. Um, and then you can kind of just state what your salary would, what, what you would like your salary to be, say what you would like your, your startup to be. And as, as Danica was saying, I think, you know, the idea that they know that you have another position um, gives you much more um, leeway at those negotiation stages. Yeah, and I'll add just briefly at the end from my own experiences. I got a phone call from the department head, and then um, shortly thereafter, they sent me a first draft offer and then asked me, uh, but there were there were blanks in the numbers. And so they asked me to 
send them with a spreadsheet and fill those in, and we went back and forth on that. Uh, but, you, but these kind of on-campus interviews were anywhere between January through April, and so um, similar to what other people have said, I uh, asked for you know, an extension on um, my decision so that I could finish through the interview process and make um, a final decision. Um, they were uh, amenable to that. Thank you. Uh, well, some of you mentioned that you had multiple offers. Um, so uh, how did you navigate through different offers and how did you balance multiple offers at staggered times? Whoever wants to go first? Um, I don't know. I, I think um, I forget what I was going to say. <laughs> like, what is that? What What was the key parameter to select between multiple offers? Yes, I can. I can. So, um, I'd say for me, I the family culture was really important to me. I I considered salary and I considered like the benefits. Um, the location was really important. Um, like where where I felt was a better match. Um, and where my fiance would be able to find a job. Um, I also. It was really important to me that I wasn't, you know, going somewhere that had a, a toxic culture or something like that for my future students. Um, so when I did my second visit, um, I requested uh, meetings with grad students, undergrads, um, and also with people on campus who were doing. I'm I'm personally uh, pretty involved with and, and care pretty deeply about. Like campus community, um, diversity, inclusion, those sorts of things, and it was something I wanted to be really active in, um, and I didn't want to end up someplace that you know was not receptive to those things or didn't have anyone on campus that was engaged in that sort of work. Um, I didn't want to bring students into a place that where they would, you know, not not have a supportive community. Um, so I made sure to ask for meetings with people who were engaged in that work and I had a, a bunch of fantastic meetings. Um, we also, uh, I I think they got the sense, I'm coming from uh, the Bay Area in California where housing is insanely expensive and one of the one of the second visits they took us uh, out with a realtor to see houses, um, to, I think to try to impress us with uh, just how affordable the housing markets were out there, um, which was pretty effective. Uh, so considering all of those things, just kind of what, what you're going to need personally um, as well as professionally to succeed because the first few years of this job are really, really stressful. And if you're someone that does does all right in isolation um, and, and can just buckle down and work, that's great. I personally do a lot better when I have community. So uh, I needed to make sure that it would be a, an environment that I could thrive in um, and that my family would be all right in. I also, I just wanted to point out that uh, there's, so timing wise, um, I was lucky in that my offers were relatively close together. I was able to get uh, the first institute to give me an extension and the second institute was mine uh, to kind of speed things up a little bit, um, which was really, really nice for me. But um, there's always a chance that you'll get offers while you still have another, like your top choice is, is a month or three out. Um, and I would just caution people to be aware of the constraints um, that universities are under, which is that if you, if you wait too long for your first choice to make a decision, um, there's a chance that if they turn you down, your second and third choices 
will already have accepted another offer and you will lose the search. So you won't be able to hire anyone at all. Um, and generally, I think from what I've heard, institutes are, if they make the call that you're their choice, they're, they're willing to try their very best to, to wait for you and, and get you on board. But um, I think being conscientious about that um, and as transparent as you can be, um, if you're feeling like, you know, I, I really don't think I'm, I'm interested in this position so that they're not kind of like getting hung out um, on their second choice will go a long way because these people are, are also your future colleagues. So wherever you end up, you don't want to, you know, give people uh, a bad impression of you. Yeah, I would, I would agree with all of that. Um, another thing I would add is, you know, if you're, you know, if you're in the, the, the Bay Area or in the Midwest, and obviously your, your salaries are probably going to be different. But, you know, if you want to use like a cost of living calculator, that's what I did to compare what, you know, what the true salaries are to have an idea of which one is, is really higher. Um, another thing to take a look at are uh, retirement packages. Um, you know, if there's employee matches, um, that kind of thing is, is can vary quite a bit uh, from one institution to another too. Oh yeah, to add to that, um, I didn't look as much as I wish I had into kind of internal funding options so mines doesn't have that many uh, like internal fellowships and uh, grants and things like that. Um, and the other institute had, it was a big R1, they had a ton of money. So student comes in and they're automatically guaranteed five years of TA ship if you can't fund them. Um, and I didn't realize how competitive the TA ships were at mines. I don't know that that would have factored into my decision, but it, it's definitely something to consider what your other funding and support options are. Okay, thank you everyone. Everyone, thank you so much. Really, um, it was so helpful for me, and I hope it was so helpful for everybody else. And with all that, I think we can wrap up. And I would like to thank again for our all our panelists for all their helpful and authentic advices. And I think Quasi had some upcoming events that they would like to advertise for. Sure, yeah, if you want to change the slide. Yeah, so just real quick, um, a few announcements. So uh, we do have another fall cyber seminar series, Emerging Advances in Hydrologic Education, starting October 2nd. Um, and then we also have two fellowships open. Um, both are, the application deadline is October 11th. Uh, we have more information on our website, and um, you guys can contact John Pollock at Quasi if you have any questions on either one of those things. Great, thank you. And um, it was really wonderful having all of you on the panel today. And thank you, um, thank you again. Uh, I would like to say that we have one more cyber seminar coming next Thursday on job transition, which might be a little bit far out for some of our attendees, but that's something that you will have to deal with in the future. So we hope you all uh, can join us. And uh, once again, thank you so much to all our panelists. Great, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Good luck, everyone.